Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right, everyone. Welcome to your Money Momentum podcast. Uh, Tom Kennedy here with my partner in crime, Kevin Curley. Kevin, what's going on? <laughs> I don't commit any crimes. Uh, well, Tom, I learned something new last week. Did you know that the person who leads CalPERS, the largest public pension fund in the United States, only has a high school degree, runs $500 billion approximately, depending on the day? Wow. Did not know that. I wonder how many others Not to have. say that you have to have a college degree to be good at investing, but typically you tend to have, I don't know, a master's of finance, uh, some experience running a hedge fund before you get to manage $500 billion, but uh, apparently not in California. Well, they do things a little backwards in California, as we all as we all know. Well, let's uh, <laughs> let's jump into it. Shine those boots! It's time for Ooh, Central Bank Roundup. Let's start with rates. There was a lot of optimism off of the October lows last year. The market uh, just went straight up, and a lot of that was driven by the the tone and the dovish. Uh, the dovish tone of, of the Fed. And, you know, at one point they were thinking six, seven rate cuts this year. And that is all, that is all flip flop. In fact, if you look at the uh, CME Fed watch tool, there is an 18% chance that they're going to cut in the June meeting. One month ago, that was a 66% chance going into the year. I think it was close to a hundred. So changes every day. Um, and a lot of that change has come from the, the hot inflation numbers we saw a couple weeks ago. And that's the big question now is, is the Fed going to cut? There's been talks of them potentially even raising if, if they start seeing inflation go, go the, the opposite direction, which I don't think it's gonna, is going to happen. But um, what are your thoughts there? I have a few things. Number one is our man, Nikki T over at the Wall Street Journal, Nick Timoros. He uh, published right after the Fed meeting saying, now the question is if they'll cut not when they'll cut for 2024. And so um, it's pretty clear that we, uh, as an industry for predicting things, uh, we're wrong again. <laughs> January 1, the consensus was a lot of cuts and that consensus was wrong. And it'll be continued update. Now things can happen and it ends up being, you know, what happens. But yes, uh, I think there's another thing, but I would, I would follow up with that saying the impact of this, if you look at the US dollar, 34 year high against the yen, uh, there's talks of the euro and the dollar going back to parity again. Uh, it's just taking off as far as strength on the fact that the rates are not going to be cut. And a lot of that was priced in and now that's getting priced out. Yeah. And, you know, I was looking at so the uh, FMOC, it's, it's a committee and they have their dot plots on which each member. It's not just Jeremy Powell that, uh, you know, has the overall say it's an actual committee and they have their dot plots that they started um, over a decade ago. And this is the first time I've seen the dot plot. Um, so the average is four point six. So the the committee is estimating still three cuts this year but the market for the first time in a long time is actually above that the market's been below that and i think the market's calling their bluff the market is pricing in one cut by the end of the year uh which is which is really telling and you know i said this before i i go by what the market's pricing in so the market's pricing in one cut and the and the dot plot's still pricing in three I, you know, I don't think you're going to get a cut this year. Um, that, you know, it, it, the data comes in and my, my thoughts change, but there's no reason for them. Their biggest risk is, is cutting too quickly. They've said that over and over. They haven't changed that uh, thought process. And if inflation doesn't continue to come down or worse, it continues to go up. We've seen it peak up in the last couple months. Um, there's no reason for them for them to cut right now. Yeah, I, I think I maintain that I don't know when they're going to cut, but when they do, I think it'll be aggressive. Uh, so far, their actions have just been one thing, which is they changed their quantitative tightening policy. Uh, so before they were selling a tremendous amount of bonds and stocks back into the market, not stocks, sorry, just bonds and other fixed income products back into the market. They've cut that in half. 
Um, you know, if they're worried about interest rates really spiking and that kind of impact of monetary policy, uh, the raising rates, you don't want to be selling bonds into that environment. They actually lost money last year. Uh, so they can job own, they can do whatever they want as far as what we're going to do higher for longer and so forth. But I look at their actions and they're kind of easing by not tightening as much as they were before on the quantitative side. So I think the last thing we'll see is when they do cut rates, they'll cut and they'll cut aggressively. But I couldn't tell you if that'll be in June, September or next year. But so far, they've taken the first step of reducing the quantitative tightening that's going on in the background. But, yeah. You know, I think when they said they were going to off, it was going to be like watching paint dry. I think it's a little more exciting than watching paint dry. Yeah, well, speaking of job owning, it's, it, it's working. Just the hawkish tone as of late. I mean, you have mortgage rates now um, for the first time in probably over over a year, back above 7%. So rates are ticking up and they're going, they're, they're moving up without them having to move rates up. So what does this mean for the overall market? In my opinion, is that there was too much optimism priced in. We've given a little bit back in the equity markets, which is natural. You, you typically, on average, you see a 14% intra-year decline on the S&P. We've had 5% so far since the high this year. And as long, I think the only time this is bad news for the overall market is if they actually raise again. I think that's very, I still think that's highly unlikely unless we see some crazy inflation numbers. But if they don't cut between now and the end of the year, it's not, it's not the worst thing. We're starting to see company earnings. Companies are, are, are weathering these higher interest rates, but it is a lagging effect. So I think the big story for the between now and the end of the year is not interest rates, it's not inflation, it's growth in the economy. If growth starts to fade, then we have this stagflation environment again. And that's where you could have a big sell-off in, in the market and retest those loads. Yeah, I think... Uh... I think it's a wait and see situation. I do think that Jerome Powell is a little bit of a political animal. Um, if you think about when he first started raising rates, it was essentially the day after he got reappointed for his new term, he went to work to raise rates and he raised them very aggressively. So, you know, we have some pretty big political things on the horizon in November. I think that once that passes by, he'll do whatever he's been wanting to do for the last six months or a year, whether that's cut or to raise rates. I think he's waiting to try to not be uh, in the mix of the political feud that goes on. But let's jump across the pond, Tom. Let's talk about the Bank of England. Your man, Ben Bernanke, ben Bernanke uh, I know you wrote his book. I know you have a lot of things uh, to say about him. He did a comprehensive review of the Bank of England, and he has notes, and he has thoughts. Um, did you have any takes on some of his suggestions? He put on things that are like, you guys should communicate better, which I think everybody can do, right? But He's got some other things like improve looking at wages and supply and uh, updating their software and technology. Uh, you know, you read his book. What, what are the tips you think he gave the Bank of England? Yeah, I mean, you know, everyone needs to be on the same page when it comes to the central banks. I mean, we're more interconnected than we ever have been before. Um, and if everyone can meet and be on the same page, um, his take was that it could it, you could weather the storm a lot better than if you have these central banks all doing their their own thing. Um, so, you know, I think it it would be beneficial to have everyone on that same page and to because because you you mentioned the currencies. I mean, that's a big thing: inflating and deflating currencies, and what we do here affects the rest of the world. I mean, the the, the dollar is still the, the the standard currency around the world, so it has it has a major impact. Um, and you don't want to see certain central banks do one thing versus versus the other. And I think I think they're there. I think everyone learned after two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. They all had to pull together um, because if our markets crash, then that's a ripple effect across across the world, um, and that's that's only gotten stronger in, in in my opinion. So, yeah, let's go across the English Channel. So the Bank of England they got reviewed by Bernanke. He gave them a lot of suggestions about communication. Their neighbors over at the ECB, they can't stop talking. Their communication is stellar. If you look at the Financial Times, the two weeks leading up to their meetings. They're going to tell you everything they're going to do. It's impressive the way they can just kind of disseminate their information. So um, they're actually thinking about adding their own dot plot and talks about the benefits that the Fed has of doing theirs. But one of the things they did at their last meeting is they did not cut rates, but said at our next meeting, wink, we're going to cut rates. So without saying it directly, they said they're going to cut rates. And one of the things they looked at was falling loan demand. Another thing is they had their inflation problem is getting kind of under control compared to other parts of the world. 
And so we've seen the U.S. dollar strengthen against the euro. Uh, and that's not uncommon when countries have a rise or a decrease in the interest rate. It has a profound impact on the currency. So if the Fed is going to keep rates high here, possibly raise them, and the ECB is going to cut rates, you should see a reaction on the euro. Now, the thing about it is they won't wait until the actual announcement. It's anticipated. So markets move before the action actually happens in anticipation. It's a great game. So now that it's in there, you see that we went from 110 on the euro down to 105. And, you know, we mentioned earlier, there's calls for it to go to parity. So uh, what are your thoughts on the ECB? And we'll say they're over communication style. No, I think the more transparent, the better. Um, you know, you met, we mentioned jawboning and it, it's real. They can move rates and they can move currencies without actually ever doing anything just by talking, uh, by forming these meetings, by forming these press conferences. I mean, this is this all started back in the Greenspan era back in 2003. I think August was the first meeting where they gave forecasts on, hey, here's what we think. Here are the dot plots. So the more they can communicate. Um, I think the better as opposed to catching everyone off guard and 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 raising or, or lowering or whatever they're going to do, the more guidance that they can provide the market, um, the less caught off guard people are, are going to be. And I don't and I think that'll hopefully cause for, for less volatility, which is what we want to see at the end of the day. Yeah, well, let's finish by talking about the the last and possibly the most fun and interesting central bank, which is the Bank of Japan. These guys, I don't know if it's just a time zone thing, but they love to do some wild stuff while we're asleep. Uh, they intervene in their currency regularly. I remember you and I, I think two years ago, we were talking about, they were saying, I think it was 135 or the 143 price to dollars. And they go, well, if it gets there, we're gonna intervene. And they did. And so they kind of let you know it was coming quietly. And then they did something. Now, now it's like 150, 155. Uh, that's a pretty big decrease for the value of the yen. Now, that's helped if you're exporting from Japan and you got a weak yen, you're doing way more in export dollars, or sorry, export yen in terms of their local currency. Um, you think the Bank of Japan is going to surprise everybody and do another intervention, or you think they're going to be calm? I mean, this was something where they, they do the most fun central bank stuff. They did yield curve control, Tom. They've done intervention they, they do all the things that you read about in textbooks or academics debate about hey wouldn't it be neat if we could do this they do those things so the the wild card in the in the game of central banks is the bank of japan what do you what do you think their next move is? yeah i mean the whole yen carry trade was a was a huge thing for them they were borrowing at next to nothing and investing in 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 our debt over here which had much higher yields and even after the currency mm -hmm. capturing that spread i mean they've been at a low rate environment and and no inflation for for decades so i don't know what to expect out of uh the bank of japan but <laughs> they are the wild card and it wouldn't, wouldn't wouldn't surprise me if they stepped in again with some more intervention yeah i mean two years ago we spent some time talking about it and you can actually see on the chart it was probably summer of 2023 uh the intervention, the thing's going like this, and then it just stops. <laughs> you go, wow, okay, and then it goes down very sharply, very quickly. So if we see that again, it's kind of in the point where it's might go parabolic at 155. So um, I'd expect the Bank of Japan to do something. I couldn't tell you what they're going to do, but uh, nobody wants to see their currency just set on fire, and they're on a 34-year low against the dollar. So that's a massive depreciation. Yeah, and, and these these central banks have such a vested interest too in in not only our currency but our debt because they own so much of it. So that has a lot to do with it and a lot to do with their decisions. And like I said, I think we're just so on a global scale, we're so interconnected more than we ever been before that um, yeah, this this collaboration and they're looking at what each other are doing. It's just going to continue. And I, I think I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens here and we'll see what happens with the Fed and, and these inflation numbers. And um, I would not be shocked uh, if we don't get a cut at all this year. I think they're going to wait and then wait another six months just to be safe. Um, and the market's, the market's telling you that right now. The market is uh, a full percentage point off from where the dot plot is, which is telling. That's the first time I've seen it higher um, since, since looking at this. So, all right. Thanks, Kevin. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum.
All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.